Hello friends, I'm Ashish Sarpari, founder and CEO of Axiomize. To our new listeners, welcome. And to our old listeners, welcome back. In today's podcast, I'm going to talk about why processors need formal verification. So let's start off by describing what a processor is. So a processor, or more commonly um, known as a microprocessor, is an omnipresent thing. It is present in your phones, TV, your Xboxes, your laptops, desktops, servers, smart meters, your smart thermostat, cars, planes, trains. You know, you name something and there is a high likelihood that a processor is powering it. So what is a processor? So at a high level, it is a computation machine that calculates computes arithmetic and logic functions to implement some high-level functionality, usually driven by a piece of software layered on top of an operating system. You might be familiar with Unix or Windows or Linux or Android or Mac OS. And this piece of software that I'm talking about could be your favorite app or a word processing software or your favorite video or gaming app. Anything and everything that interacts with us visually or otherwise and executes something automatically usually needs to run on a computing machine. And more often than not, this computing machine uses a microprocessor. So some of us who are old enough uh, would know that some of the earliest ones, um, this was an Intel 8080, a Z80, Motorola 6800, you know, so on. So IBM and Intel have dominated this segment for many, many years from the earliest PCs and servers to uh, modern day desktops. Although to be honest, Intel and AMD now dominate the desktop and the laptop and the server markets. However, for mobile computing, ARM architecture is the dominant one though. um, With the advent of the fifth generation open source RISC-V architecture, RISC-V Um, things are changing rapidly. Um, So, okay, so I just used the word architecture. So what does that mean? Um, Architecture, my friend, is the most critical thing that defines what a processor does, but most importantly, how it does it. And how is essential as it impacts whether the processor can execute computations fast, in a safe way, in a secure way, and doesn't consume so much power, you know, your battery, so that it drains your laptop or mobile phone in an hour. So architecture in many ways defines performance, power, efficiency, and how big or small the processor is going to be. Um, In technical terms, what is the area footprint going to be? Um, What instructions are going to run on the processor? How are they going to be uh, uh, decoded, interpreted? And how are they going to be executed? So in very simple terms, a processor usually has some storage space. So you must have heard of some thing called caches. It's got register files. It's got an arithmetic logic unit, an ALU, and some uh, way of doing input-output, I.O. So every processor has some storage space from where it reads instructions to execute. It has some data storage from where it reads the data on which the instructions have to be applied. It has register files where it keeps a local copy of the data to process and a storage memory where it stores the after effects of computation for those instructions that require the data to be kept in the memory. So the word memory is loaded in our discussion today. There are several forms of memories, of course. There are these high-speed memories such as register files, uh, caches. Then you have uh, random access memories, often known as a memory. You must have heard it on a phone having a two gigabyte memory or a laptop having a 64 gigabyte RAM, as they say. And finally, you have the hard drives, the hard disk based memory. So what does a processor execution entail? Okay. So in very simple terms, you know, what a processor does is performs arithmetic operations such as addition, subtraction, multiplication and division, and also comparison operations like comparing something to um, something else for equality, um, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to, and so on. So 
if all that the processor does is read instructions and executes it for arithmetic and logic instructions, how could it be complex enough um, for us to, you know, to have a big challenge for verification? So the thing is, like every machine, most modern processors are highly optimized for performance and power. It means usually they will have several instructions in flight at any time, and several of these may be competing for the same shared resource, such as registers, ALU components, and so on. Therefore, ensuring that there is no conflict in accessing shared resources, um, you know, it's often called the arbitration problem, is one of the main verification challenges to make sure that two um, uh, components within the processor are able to access the sh same shared resource in a safe way. Now, to speed up computations, processors usually employ pipelining, a concept where one instruction can be in the fetch mode, another one can be in the decode mode, a third can be during an execution mode where it is going through some ALU operations, and another one might be in the write back mode. So, so this is this is not uncommon in modern day processors. So what we are interested in knowing is whether all of these instructions that are in flight, that if they follow the correct order of execution without conflict and can finish off safely, leaving no side effects and producing the right result. And you know, usually some form of complex control logic is implemented in processors to make sure that all of this is as expected. But there's a lot that can go wrong. For example, um, when an instruction is taken apart, that is when it is decoded to figure out what it actually means, we could get a wrong result due to a functional bug. We might want to execute an instruction to read data from memory. Uh, in a microprocessor's case, it's called a load instruction. But if the decode is wrong, we may end up storing the result in the memory, meaning executing a store instruction. So if the sequencing of instructions, often called ordering, is incorrect, we may end up reading before writing. For example, we may end up doing a load before a store. So scheduling and instruction ordering are also critical to check, you know, not just the decoding. In fact, due to concurrency, there's a massive impact on control, and both are important and very hard to verify. Now, we talked about I.O., remember a little while ago, and that a processor should be able to interact with external input and output. Interaction with I.O. can happen at any point in time, of course, during the processor's execution phases or decode phase or, or, or a fetch phase, and the processor needs to be able to react to it on time without losing the result of what it already had in the flight, what results it had computed. So this means interacting with what is technically called interrupts. So interrupts usually interrupt the processor's normal execution phase and then cause the processor to do something. Out of, um, out of the normal execution phases. So verifying that the interaction of a processor with interrupts is an integral part of a processor's verification plan. And a processor often interacts with these external I.O. devices through um, what is called a direct memory access controller called a DMA controller. And ensuring that the interaction of processor with the DMA and the system bus, um, you know, that it is sound, is, is a massive verification challenge though not strictly a processor verification challenge, but closely related enough to be addressed at the same time. So now remember we said a processor performs arithmetic and logic computations, and you know, processors use the digital bit representations of 0 and 1, and these bit representations are used to denote what we know as integers, both positive and negative, and floating point numbers. You might know them from maths as decimal numbers or even real numbers. Strictly speaking, floating point numbers and real numbers are a little different, uh, but floating point number is a way of denoting uh, decimal numbers in computers. The verification of integer arithmetic and floating point arithmetic is a non-trivial exercise. In fact, it is so non-trivial that when Intel in 1995 got its floating point division algorithm wrong, it had to replace every single Pentium processor in the world, costing the company nearly uh, you know, half a billion USD in 1995. The bug was a rare defect, you know, but it affected the outcome of some of the competitions. So Intel invested a huge sum of money after that and did some world-class formal verification work following from that. And the focus was always on verifying the arithmetic uh, in, in Intel processors. 
talking about the processor and its interaction with the external world, another important facet of it is the interaction of the processor with external memory. When a processor cannot store everything in its local memory, in its caches, the processor stores it externally in RAMs and external hard drives, which means that the data is kept as a backup externally and must remain consistent with what was stored in the first place in the cache. So now things get really interesting when multiple processors try to access the same shared data via their caches. This can lead to plenty of fun, you know. One processor uh, writes the data to memory and would like to read it back later, but then that data gets changed by another processor without notifying the previous processor that it has changed it. This causes a problem that caches in their, in their respective processors are now not consistent, not coherent with the main memory. This is the cache coherency problem closely connected with microprocessors. And cache coherency in all modern day microprocessors is implemented in hardware, offering a major significant verification challenge. Now again, due to the sheer number of combinations of multiple processors, lots of shared lines of memory, possible sequencing of reads writes from these processors. You know, so why is the processor verification hard, right? So we talked about decoding problems, arbitration bugs, defects that arise due to pipelining, instruction interleaving, interrupts, interaction with DMA controllers, and cache coherency. And not to leave the arithmetic verification, right? But we've not so far mentioned about power, safety, and security, which are offering uh, a lot of you know pain to verification engineers worldwide. For example, processors have secure compartments these days only accessible by privileged instruction. So what happens if a non-privileged instruction accesses it? What if a hacker orchestrates this externally? To save power, hardware designers often use explicit access in the design, so synthesis tools can optimize the area and save power. Memories, for example, are never initialized. It is great for power, but not good for verification. If an uninitialized memory is read before it has been written, a processor can simply execute garbage, causing all sorts of problems. Now, if there are two copies of these processors, often the case with cars, for example, they're expected to run in lockstep fashion, it can cause a hell of a lot of problem for the car. So functional safety is directly impacted by these power saving optimizations in processors. So unless the processors are verified explicitly for these features, we can never be sure that they work correctly. Now, using a digital device, um, you know, we usually know that it operates in zeros and ones, and in silicon, there are usually two states, zero and one. However, for verification for X's, there are usually three possible states, a third one being an X's state. Actually, you know what? X verification is often done in tools on a four-valued state, where the fourth state is a Z, a high impedance state. So imagine a 64-bit architecture, usually on a two-state model, we have two to the power 64 states, which is pretty big. It's about 1.844 into 10 to the power 19. But now with this new state, um, two extra states, we're talking about four to the power, four into 10 to the power, uh, sorry, four to the power 64 reachable states in verification, um, which is about what, 3.44 into 10 to the power 38. You know, that's way much more than the total number of stars in the, in the universe, you know. Um, in fact, by some estimates, it's expected to be over 100 billion or about that range. So, you know, that's a lot of combinations and um, input combinations and states that need to be tested. And there's no amount of dynamic simulation that can ever verify these processors exhaustively uh, for functional defects uh, arising due to arbitration issues or arithmetic flaws or pipelining, decoding, bugs, cache coherency, you know, DMA issues, interrupts, or power safety and security. So we're talking about verifying these processors within months, you know, often in less than six months. And formal verification can actually provide an excellent methodology of being able to conquer a lot of these verification challenges, often in a much more efficient and accurate manner. But how exactly is formally used for processor verification? Well, um, let me point you to a talk I gave recently to the RISC V Summit. Uh, in December last year, and I talked about finding a range of bugs, functional power, safety, and security using formal verification. 
that and in some cases uh, some of the processors were previously verified with simulation in fact one of them was already in silicon so there's a hell lot of challenges um, for us to cover uh, for microprocessor and uh, I hope I've been able to convince you that actually microprocessor verification cannot be done adequately with conventional testing and simulation and formal verification should be considered for this. So I hope you liked today's podcast. Uh, do ping us at info at xmis.com. Subscribe us uh, on our YouTube channel and let us know. Stay in touch, stay fit and stay healthy. And see you next week.